All right, so now we're on the late Middle Ages and the 14th and 15th century. So uh, in this section, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, medieval social structure. So we'll talk about nobilities and nobility and peasants. We'll talk a little bit about, about the political structure and we'll talk about the change, uh, or more importantly, the revival of trade, commerce, and industry. As medieval monarchs successfully centralized their governments, the powers of nobles and knights declined, essentially because kings found new sources of revenue by taxing cities, cities and towns. And this income allowed them to hire knights who fought for them as long as they were paid. So ultimately, monarchs learned that a paid army was more dependable than knights and nobles. As kings brought law and order to their cities and town, it spurred the revival of trade, commerce, and industry that had really begun in the 12th century. And although towns lost some independence as governments grew, you know, str uh, strong kings offered protection and kept them from being being invaded. And the kings wanted their, their cities to be protected because it was the center of business and an important source of taxes. And as a result, commerce became more capitalistic. In the early years of the 14th century, Urban populations also grew because pe pleasant peasants just fled from a series of famines in the countryside, not to mention uh, the population that was weakened by famine um, and the Black Death, which is um, which struck Europe in, in the, the mid 1300s and repeatedly throughout the 14th and 15th century. It's one of the few times where population, world population actually decreased. As the population shifted from rural to urban, late medieval society can be divided into three classes, the nobility, the bourgeoisie, and the peasants, with the clergy being a, a kind of a distinct group um, because we talked about in the last lecture how their fashion stayed pretty, pretty static. So essentially society was divided into those who prayed together, those who fought together, and the rest of society, which all labored together. If we were just to judge the nobility on, based on the, on the painted images we, we have, we would think that their life was just an endless round of, you know, riding and hunting and feasting, partying, just entertainment, music, dancing, and of course, fighting each other, right? Going, going to war. And uh, entertainment amongst the nobility uh, provided a stage for the display of their fashion. Wealthy men and women uh, generally dressed in, you know, in rich in silk brocade. So a, a silk woven fabric. We've talked about how expensive silk silk was. So silk brocades and velvet, oftentimes uh, trimmed in fur. And you know, the garments that were worn by um, nobility and their fam family and members of the court have been described at length uh, in chronicles of the period and painted by artists of the time. One of the recorded uh, inventories, right, um, was made in 1420, the clothing of Philip the Good. He was a, a French um, of, the, of the court of Burgundy, of the Burgundy Empire, and it mentions a silk hat with peacock feathers, flowers, and gold spangles. Um, so just the, the decadence that that describes is, is very um, interesting. By the close of the 14th century, uh, women as well had adopted some extravagant uh, styles. And women, and you, we probably know this image, they adopted um, a, a tall, exaggerated steeple-shaped uh, headdress called the hennin. And the word hennin is derived from an old French word meaning to inconvenience. And certainly, you know, a tall peaked hat <laughs> was an inconvenience. Just the word itself, Hennen, wasn't just used as a fashion term, but rather to poke fun at the extreme, extreme style. And there were actually sumptuary laws that regulated the size of this hat. So princesses could wear um, a Hennen that was a yard in, in height, while uh, ladies not of such higher royal birth were permitted to wear hats no more than 24 inches tall. Our next class is the bourgeoisie, and we know this word now, we use it, right? We bougie, <laughs> right? This is where it comes from. The term comes from the bourgeoisie. And the bourgeoisie is just uh, the middle class, and merchants often made up this middle class. Oftentimes, they were 
uh, men of modest income, although some of them became so rich and powerful that they actually helped finance the government of a king. This bourgeoisie, this middle merchant class, uh, they lived fairly comfortably. And the role of women in this society, the, the role of the wife of a mer merchant was that she supervised the household, but she did not do much of the work um, herself. And she essentially lived and, and dressed in a non-extravagant form. However, <laughs> this is why we use the word bourgeoisie and bougie, because some some merchants did demonstrate their affluence through lavish dress for themselves and their wives and their family. And as a result, there was a passage of a whole host of sumptuary laws during this peri period. And that really testifies to the growth and the growing tendency of well-to-do folks imitating the nobility. So these sumptuary laws really sought to regulate who could wear certain fabrics or furs or colors and trimmings. And for example, in, in the time of, uh, of Edward the Fourth in England, about the 1450s, there actually was a sumptuary law entitled, and I quote, for the outrageous and excessive apparel of diverse people against their degree to the great destruction and impoverishment of all in the land. And finally, we are at the peasants. And peasants are often depicted as, you know, folks living a hand-to-mouth existence, right? So working the land, planting and harvesting, you know, tending to sheep, um, wearing everyday clothing that was plain and, you know, serviceable. M pretty much what's like what's been described in the, in the earlier medieval period. So a tunic, stockings, uh, and a cloak. In this period, textiles became an important trade commodity. And, you know, some of the stirrings and interests of a fashionable dress uh, appeared because of the creation of more luxurious textiles. And, you know, class distinction became less rigid and people were able to wear and maintain more uh, luxurious textiles. You know, not only the textiles themselves became important, but also the construction. In the world of clothing construction, different craftsmen made different items of dress. So, you know, tailors made garments, they increasingly used buttons, which made getting in and out of those tighter fitting garments easier. There were professional lingerie makers, there were people who made veils and boot makers and shoe makers. Uh, and those rapid changes in dress extended to accessories and decorative adornments. Really, the 14th century is when fashion change begins, and historians can really pinpoint this, this century with that change. You know, because royal families kept inventories of gifts and purchases, they have lists that describe fabrics that include their cost and from what it was made and, and, and what, clothing, what fabric it was made from, and often they can precisely date the introduction of a style from these descriptions. As always, we, we've been talking about rites of passage, garments that, that people wear, special occasions. Um, and, and mostly in the Middle Ages, it was still baptisms uh, and funerals. And there was a, a linen um, veil that was used during baptism, and, uh, but no special costumes for marriages. However, mourning, you know, widows definitely had a more fixed garment. Widows, um, you know, they avoided bright colors and they, they pretty much wore shades of violet and gray for, for the rest of, of their life if, if they did not remarry. So, um, you know, a mother, however, would wear, you know, black on the death of her, her child. Um, but by the spring, she was, was back to wearing colors again. So instead of me, uh, you listening to me and my descriptions of, of the garments, we're going to watch two videos with uh, the typical garments that men and women wore. And you'll see some continuation of what we've seen before. So you'll continue to see the chemise, which was known as a frock or a shift in the English language. You definitely will still see uh, cloaks and, and hoods and capes. And you'll also see the frock, which is just a loose fitting gown. 